Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dale Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. This is your first time tuning into the show. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Or if you are tuning in on ESPN on 1090, thank you so much for joining us. You can catch the full episode over at Chargers Unleashed on YouTube. Dan Wolkenstein, sir, how are you? I'm great. Happy Friday to you, Jake, and to everyone listening and tuning in wherever you are. Uh, Weekend is ahead of us. Chargers fans, you guys are probably excited a bit because, Jake, the Chargers got a free agent cornerback, according to sources. Christian Fulton is a Chargers cornerback, now signing a one-year deal, according to sources. Uh, But this episode, I think, is all about perspective. It's all about the Chargers roster construction, what they are doing why they are doing it, what has been done, and what is left to be done because there are some critical holes still left on this roster. But Joe Hortiz and Jim Harbaugh are doing what they have set out, what we've all thought they would. Maybe a little bit uncomfortable for Chargers fans, but we're here to talk about it. Jake, how are you? Fantastic. Fridays are usually... It's hard to find something bad about Fridays when they come around. (laughs) Good. Good. Before we get to the meat and potatoes, Jake, let's pay the bills. Let's talk about our friends. I want to remind everybody that the best way to keep yourself into all of the latest sports action, it's underdog fantasy and their pick'em game. Just pick higher or lower on all of your favorite or least favorite player stats. And you could win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Underdog keeps it super simple with their easy to use website and mobile apps. Just pick between two and five players to fill out your pick'em entry. Get every pick right and take home some cold, hard cash. Use the promo code unleashed and get your first deposited doubled up to $500 by underdog. Go on on over to Underdog Fantasy today and let them know that Chargers Unleashed sent you. Jake and Chargers fans, the Jim Harbaugh and Joe Hortiz era is upon us. And they were brought in for a multitude of reasons. We don't have to rehash all the struggles that this Chargers team has faced in the past with drafting and contracts and roster evaluation and construction and salary cap maneuvering compensatory picks, you name it. All of those things are what the new era has brought in to solve. And you are seeing it. And the Chargers, given the salary cap limits, limitations, given the roster construction limitations, the gaping holes at several positions, the team over the last couple weeks has kind of set out in an effort to begin filling those holes, targeted missile strikes, as Jake likes to say, to begin to shape this team into what they believe will give it its best opportunity to win a Super Bowl. To kind of set the stage, Jake, I'll let this kind of go to you. When we started the 2024 season, crazy, sorry, 2024, we knew that there was going to be a lot of turnover. We knew that there was going to be some uncomfortable conversations relative to the big four, relative to philosophy, what they're going to do with Justin Herbert and the run game and how they're going to fix the defense. And the decisions that this team has made from the front office down have aligned to and have started to showcase what they are looking to accomplish with this team. And what I find fascinating, and I want to get your take on this, Jake, the positions that they have targeted and the players they have targeted in free agency, and let's call the tier of players they've targeted. That's by design, right? Like, they did this because of all of the aforementioned things that we talked about. What did you make of what they have gone after and also what is left because of what they've gone after? I mean, like you said, it, everything that is being done now is majority from the standpoint of the situation that was put in by the old regime. You know, they had to do a lot of restructuring, obviously, as you mentioned, the uncomfortable conversations in Mike Williams being released, Keenan Allen being traded was the big one. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was many players who thought out of that big four in a situation where Keenan Allen was not going to be remaining with the Chargers. So now you look at the way that that has shaked out and the relation to the rest of your roster priorities leading up to the NFL draft. So Gus Edwards, I think was one of the least, you know, worst kept secrets as it relates to a player that the chargers were going to end up targeting with Joe Hortiz as the GM. And I I've said this before on some of our other shows. I really believe that they are going full swing into this 
for a running back by committee, much in the way that it does has been done for Baltimore for several years. You don't necessarily have to have your bell cow three down back. You're going to be able to conjure up a lot of different formations and a lot of different run styles due to a variable at running back position. And for the Chargers, as it currently stands right now with them having Gus Edwards, Isaiah Spiller, how do you fill out the rest of that running back stable? I think this is maybe where the benefit of Greg Roman comes in and as an offensive coordinator is because he ran multiple schemes for the running backs at during his time with Baltimore with John Harbaugh and during his time in San Francisco when he was coaching with Jim. So I'm interested to see how they're ultimately going to fill this out. And for Gus coming in on a two-year deal, I think that was a nice value size move for the type of running game that they're going to be able to create. You look at other positions around, Obviously, the most notable will probably be the linebackers. The Chargers lost three of them in free agency and Kenneth Murray, Eric Kendricks, and Eamon Abuniba. And they needed to obviously fill that out. Dayon Henley, to this point, is still a question mark because he hasn't gotten a chance to see much of the field due to players that were ahead of him. He was limited to mainly special teams duty last year. So you go out and you get Troy Dye and Denzel Perryman on one-year deals. Denzel Perryman will be 33 years old by the time that the NFL season ends up kicking off. So you know that you're definitely going to look at what's the future going to look like at the linebacker position, especially with Jesse Minter's defense. He needs those linebackers who are going to cover. So how are they going to end up prioritizing that? Bradley Bozeman coming in as a center. Familiarity in Greg Roman's offense, familiarity in uh, Baltimore in general. But on on a one-year deal, it's a stopgap situation because the Chargers need to find their center of the future. So I think in whether you want to call them Band-Aid scenarios and just things to kind of get you over the hump of maybe a a one-year transition to prioritize free agent deals or even draft picks in 2025. This is how you can skirt the salary cap situation that you've been in place of. Now, it, it doesn't necessarily eliminate the Chargers targeting these positions in the draft in 2024, but in terms of where the priorities are, it probably brings center down a little bit. It probably brings running back down a little bit you may have to elevate linebacker a little bit more and you definitely have to prioritize wide receiver and corner so it's it's always interesting navigating this pre-free agency and you know to the nfl draft and post because so many priorities change in this period of time yeah and i, and I wanted to kind of provide like a little bit of a, a visual representation of this uh what the Chargers have done and what still needs to be done. And for folks who are watching, you'll see a bunch of pretty colors here. Uh, For folks who are listening, I'll try my best to describe this. But across the board, Chargers have done a bunch of work. They've signed a running back. They've signed two tight ends, a center, two linebackers, a corner. They re-signed Alohi Gilman, restructured Khalil Mack and Joy Bosa. Like, they've done lots of stuff. They brought in Foster Sorrell back. They re-signed Cameron Dicker. Like these are lots of positions that needed to get done. Some of which were pretty conclusively going to be done, but running back tight ends, center linebackers, shoring up the defensive line. There's a theme there. (laughs) All of that is trench warfare. And we've all heard that's what this team is looking to do. That's what they need to beef up. That's what they're predicated on. What you're not hearing what we have not heard yet are those big splash free agents, the big splash, big ticket corners, wide receivers, edge players, uh, offensive linemen, running backs. They, they haven't gone after those. And there's a reason for that, I believe. And a lot of this, and again, this kind of comes back to why Joe Horty was brought in to this team was kind of, his prowess and his experience in Baltimore with Howie and company and how this team needs to be constructed through value positionally. So you look at how much top tier contracts are in free agency for guys like corner or wide receiver or tackle or hell, even guards and running backs in this free agency class, they're making 15, 20, 30 million dollars a year. And until they traded Keenan Allen, they had pennies and they had dozens of holes to be filled on this roster. 
So what do they do? They go and do value signings at value positions, low historically low value positions monetarily. And what that does is it enables them to be more focused on those big ticket, high positional value positions come draft time. There's still time. They still have waves three and four and post NFL draft to go after positions that they have yet to fill. But the strategy is starting to take shape in terms of like what Chargers fans could expect to see in the NFL draft. And we all have heard talks about trade downs. We've heard about like, you know, the discussion of going tackle the wide receiver and all that stuff. But what is clear to me is they have left some of the mission critical positions that have to be filled to be found in the draft early on. Jake, like, what do you see as kind of like the day one, two, maybe rounds one through four, given what they've done, given what is left? Like they don't have, in my opinion, an outside corner on the roster right now. You could argue they don't have wide receiver one. You know that. They don't have wide receiver two, maybe, depending on what you see, Josh Palmer. You don't know Quentin Johnston. Right now, your running back two is the running back that has barely seen any field in Isaiah Spiller. Your linebackers, we talked about. Your center, we talked about. Where do you see the first few picks going? Again, while, when they say they prioritize things, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to go one, two, three, four. But because of what they've signed and because of what's available, they have priority positions that need to get filled. Yeah, I think it's impossible not to say that if the Chargers were to stick and pick at five, that you don't target one of those big three wide receivers, especially if it's Marvin Harrison Jr. that ends up making his way to five. I mean, how fast can you sprint to the podium in that circumstance? Even in a circumstance, if it was... Marvin Harrison Jr. is gone, getting Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze, especially after what you have now with the way your roster looks like, with Keenan Allen being gone. Look, we've talked about wide receivers at nauseum on this show, and it was very different even when we were projecting that Keenan Allen was still going to be a part of this team. Dan's been the biggest advocate for Malik Neighbors in that circumstance, and that would have made sense if Keenan Allen was still on this roster. But I think more in the mold now, if Marvin Harrison Jr. falls to you at five, I mean, I know everybody has been talking about the trade backs, and trust me, I've been talking about it for 10 years. That would be the exception to the rule if Marvin Harrison Jr. is on the board. Now, I know everybody's talking about now the – trade backs how far could the chargers possibly go if it's a minnesota situation and you end up getting that 11th and 23rd overall pick what could you possibly do with it i think that that shifts the priorities a little bit because if you get to 11 most likely you're out of the big three conversation on getting any of harris and neighbors and a dunze by the time 11 comes around so you need to switch your priorities up a little bit more that next crop of wide receivers getting to the ad mitchells the brian thomas juniors Uh, however you want to rank them in that second tier, I think you actually wait. If you're sitting at 11, I think you switch everything up and you you prioritize corner in that circumstance. That would be a prime spot for some of the top corners to come off the the board. Terry on Arnold's, Quinion Mitchell, if you end up waiting to 23, is Nate Wiggins still on the board if you end up waiting for, for that moment? Hell, if you get this extra draft capital, it just gives you so much more flexibility. You could still see the Chargers take a corner and a wide receiver at 23. However, that ends up shaking out. Uh, Possibly even an offensive lineman with that 23rd pick. Who knows? Um, There's a lot of different ways that you can navigate it. So those are some options as far as the first round goes. I don't think that you can come out of the first two rounds without a cornerback. There's just no way that I see that happening. Whether it's round one or round two, that priority has to be set. Other options that you can look at in terms of second and third round, I think you have to address the trenches in some respect, whether that's on the offense or the defensive side of the ball. We know that Sebastian Joseph Day and Austin Johnson are coming back. Those were two big free agent swings and misses from Tom Telesco. So you brought in Puna Ford on a, on a one-year deal but you need to elevate that group up a lot more. You know, I know we talk about everything with Jim Harbaugh prioritizing the trenches. We also have to remember the defensive side of that as well. So I think that you target the, the 
the trenches in some circumstance in on rounds two and three. Linebacker, as I had mentioned just a second ago, that could apply to that too. That I think also elevates a little bit. And I specifically, Dan and I have talked about this. This would be different if we were talking about the likes of Denzel Perryman not being on this team and they needed more of a downhill stop the run type of guy. There would be a more more of a category for linebackers to choose from this circumstance. But because you need a linebacker in Jesse Minter's defense that is going to be able to show really good coverage abilities, it shortens that draft class dramatically. So it should elevate the Chargers' priority for that more, given that there's not that big of a uh, class in terms of coverage linebackers to choose from. You mentioned round one in the tradeback scenario, and, and I want to double-click on that for a second. You hear a lot of folks talk about the Chargers and Jim Harbaugh and company prioritizing the trenches, and, oh, like they're going to go offensive linemen. And don't be surprised if they go offensive linemen, and you shouldn't expect they're just going to go receiver because you know the, the new era, they don't really prioritize receivers. Like I want to be clear. Joe Hortiz is known for going best player available. He's talked about that ad nauseum. And you've seen it for decades, literally, in Baltimore. Where I see people kind of giving themselves an out when they discuss this is you hear them talk about prioritizing offensive linemen, and you hear them talking about best player available. If they stay at five, I don't think you hear many people. I'd be shocked to hear anyone who has best player available being an offensive lineman at five period. So if the chargers stay at five and they are going the best player available strategy, they are not going an offensive lineman. There is no way. So Joe Hortiz has to be careful here. Because if we're preaching best player available and we're staying at five and we go offensive tackle, that is a very different narrative than what has been discussed. Now, if you trade back and you get to 11, you get to eight, you get to 20, whatever, then there is a bit more nuance. And then you can have the discussion of the offensive lineman being the best player available. So, to be clear, if they stay at five, there is going to be so many questions. It is going to be awfully confusing if that pick is anyone other than a wide receiver, maybe a tight end, depending on how high they value Brock Bowers, which I don't don't think that would be shocking too. But, like, that would at least be like a Jim Harbaugh plus BPA thing. Yeah, right. and I don't think that you do that now with Disley and Hurst being on the roster. I don't see you adding a fifth tight end to this group with the fifth overall pick now. I, hey, nobody loves Brock Bowers more than me, but now, you know, free agency changes a lot of things in terms of perspective. Um, and now I don't see a tight end being an option at five. So to your point, Dad, yeah, it would be shocking if they stuck and pick at five and it is anything but one of the big three wide receivers. And it would make no, like, and anybody trying to, have it make sense that they would draft a tackle at five. That would not make sense given Joe Hortiz and how he runs operations as a manager. Like that does not go down that route. Although you can say Jim Harbaugh prioritized the trenches. You could prioritize the trenches in other rounds if you trade back. But I don't think anybody's going to tell you a BPA at five is a tackle. Uh, hell, offensive lineman. Any any lineman. <laughs> I mean, for, for the Chargers' current roster situation right now, prior free agency, prior to Keenan Allen and Mike Williams not being a part of this team, almost every mock that you looked at was always an offensive lineman just because of the everything lining up with how Jim Harbaugh wants to run the football and prioritize the offensive line. Makes sense. You saw everything from Joe Alt to F- Talise Fuaga to Latham, J.C. Latham being taken at five overall. Now, I think the closer that we get to the NFL draft and Trey Pipkins is still on this roster, <laughs> taking an offensive lineman, whether you're going to 
put him in at starting guard and eventually that's going to be your long-term right tackle or you're taking a right tackle in general and you're going to make Trey Pipkins a backup. With the wide receiver room the way it is right now and the talent that is going to be on the board at five, there's no way that you could possibly think that you can prioritize a luxury pick in this particular circumstance for an offensive lineman as opposed to going out and refurbishing this wide receiver group for Justin Herbert with the likes of Harrison Jr., Neighbors, or Adunze. Yeah, and and so I think to kind of close this one out, Jake, I think what a lot of fans and people covering the team, um, like there, there are different minds kind of going into these decisions, right? I think everyone would probably agree in an ideal state, Joe Hortiz and Jim Harbaugh and company would like to trade back. That's probably the ideal scenario. And in the trade back scenario, that's when like the tackle and the center and the corner and all that kind of stuff kind of come into play. If they are forced to or decide to stay at five, because either Marvin Harrison Jr. is on the board and they can't say no, or Malik Neighbors, or Dunze, or you know, one of those three guys that they fall in love with and they need them at five, or another trade partner doesn't come in, and they stay at five. It can't be tackle, dude. Like, it can't be. And I'd argue it can't be tackle, corner, safety, linebacker, defensive line, offensive line, running back. Like, it, so... I wanted to clarify because you hear a lot of people giving wiggle rooms and outs trade back gives options for tackle and corner and edge and all that stuff and receiver at five different animal. And you've seen Jesse Minter. You've seen Jim Harbaugh with the highest of praises for Marvin Harrison jr. And now as things continue, Jake, and we're seeing more and more and more and more and more and more smoke of four quarterbacks going in the top four, Arizona, open for business trading back. Minnesota has the ammunition. The Giants need to get quarterback. It seems like it's almost a foregone conclusion, and I'm trying not to get my hopes up, that four quarterbacks are going before five, or five or before. So, buckle up. They have this set out nicely. They're not done. The job's not finished. They have a lot of work to do. But the path is set, and what they've done with value positions, prove it deals, players that they've been familiar with at positions that they value and prioritize, it enables them to go for the big fish at the draft. Because again, they have the fifth pick, which is great, but every round they have the fifth pick in the second round, you get the fifth best selection. And so whether they trade back in the first, second, third, whatever, you're going to be able to get value in picks. If you trade back anything else, we went through a bunch here. Kind of the setting the stage, snap the line discussion here. Do you miss anything? No, I think the message has been clear. And uh, <laughs> this is just prime mindset to keep in your head as we get closer to the NFL draft over these next four weeks. So, Jake, I think it's time to get to our Fridays. So that friends and family enjoy the weekend. Uh, Chargers fans, Christian Fulton appears to be your latest Los Angeles Chargers on the roster. Uh, we will have free agency and draft coverage and positional best fits for the Chargers coming up here as we continue on Chargers Unleashed. Uh, but until then, you can find Jake on X at Jake T. Hefner, myself at Dan W. Sports, uh, on ESPN Radio, on Instagram, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, you name it, we're there for you. And on YouTube, be sure to hit that like and subscribe. Help us out a ton. Uh, until next time, 